thanks for joining us today, guys. Today we are joined by Petri. Uh, I will have him pronounce his last name, Finnish origin, living in Estonia, uh, lots of involvement in the, the startup world, the entrepreneurial world, and uh, excited for him to share some insights. So, uh, Petri, do you mind introducing yourself to the audience? Yeah, Petri Kajander or Kassander. You can, you can, whichever way you want to say, I've been living in different places, so people say it differently. So I don't care as long as I recognize myself. Yeah, I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. I've been building companies, mainly growth companies, startup companies. Uh, previously, I was doing them one by one, and uh, then I was doing a bit of uh, holidays between being in Spain for a few years and translating some books and and doing different things, also establishing a think tank. And uh, then I came back to the startup world again and started to do parallel entrepreneurship. So instead of doing just uh, one company at a time, I started to do uh, multiple of them, many of them at the same time. But you have to change something. You cannot obviously do it the same way. You know, nobody can do that. Well, maybe uh, Twitter's Jack used to at least do the you know, two public companies, but no, usually that's not the case. So I'm actually working with founders and focusing on the strategy and the decision making the hard part and just focusing on those companies who are really growing. And that's basically what I do. How did you get involved in the entrepreneurial space? Is it something you always kind of thought you'd want and, uh, you know, headed that direction full steam or uh, did you kind of fall into it? Um, I think I established my first company when I was 18. So yes, I would probably say that uh, it's always been there my way and you know, hopefully that way and not the highway. Uh, so I, I've been also been working for other people just for a tiny bit, but usually even in those cases, the roles were made for me. And, and, and then it's just been easier to be an entrepreneur path. You mentioned that you had traveled and lived uh, kind of across Europe. Um, did that start after a couple of the successful companies or was that kind of part of the path from the very beginning as you were, was it chasing opportunity? Was it just uh, expanding horizons? Kind of what led to that um, well, you know, um, change in geography? Well, even when I was a kid, obviously I was traveling with my parents. We went to different places. So I already stacked up uh, some number of countries that way. Then I was, I think I was 16. I spent a uh, summer in Japan. Uh, I was there living in two families and it was sort of an exchange program. So I got to know the, uh, the bullet trains and the wonders of Japan in the 90s. And uh, then I was studying in the UK and, uh, you know, the story just goes on. So I don't really consider myself that I'm just fixed in one place. My friends are all around the world. Um, I've been picking and choosing nice places. I don't really know, you know, it just depends. Sometimes it's really nice to be on the, on the sunny side by the uh, beach and the sea, but then you also tend to tend to see and, and realize that the action is usually in the north. It's nice to be on a holiday when you go to the south, but the actual business is usually happening somewhere farther away. So you have to have to move back to the north. So I've been oscillating a bit between the, uh, the sunny side and, and then the business side and I don't know whether there's any any good compromise. Maybe it's just a huge yacht somewhere, you know, where you can travel and uh, you you know you are you're staying put on the yacht, but the, the world is changing, you know, around you. So you've been very successful with a lot of different companies, Petri. Once you reach that point of profitability, right, uh, in some of those early companies, what was your strategic framework in terms of how you chose to invest that money? Did you go start new companies? Did you go you know, buy a yacht to travel the world? Did you pour it back into the company? Kind of what was the thinking in terms of, you know, how to use that profit to achieve whatever your objectives were? I think the, the main issue is not how much money you have. Even if you're not profitable, I think you can start today. Preferably, you should have started like then 20 years back, depending on your age, uh, maybe even earlier. Because the compound interest is something which Einstein said is really hard for everyone. You, know, you, you, you don't really understand the power of the compound interest. Even Warren Buffett made most of his money when he was like 70, 80 years old. If you look actually how much in absolute uh, dollars his net worth was, it's actually the compound interest over the decades. And it makes a huge difference whether you start when you're 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, or 40 years old or 50 years old, 
even if you have a tiny bit of money, if you put it aside and you let it compound and you don't take it away and you don't panic, you just uh, like the crypto world say, hodl, you just uh, hold the money and, and keep it and, and let it do it work. That's actually what, what makes you wealthy. But the wealth is not actually the money. And if you understand that, that's because um, I've been, I have my podcast as well, and I was uh, interviewing uh, one of the, the person who actually lives uh, in Switzerland in, in the winter time. He's uh, skiing there, and in the summer he actually has a huge yacht, and you know he's sending his teams to work with him on those yachts, so it's that big. And uh, and and uh, he was saying, I was asking that you know when you have enough money. And obviously he was upgrading his yacht again, and he was saying that it's, it's quite expensive and you know, he's running out of money. So there's never enough if you are not actually adjusting your mindset. So it's all in your mindset. What are your expectations? If you're going for the money game, you're going for the signaling, you have to keep up with your neighbors. If you're looking, comparing yourself to the others, you're probably spending more than you have, so you can always upgrade your car, you can always upgrade the, the, the consumables, what you have, but they don't usually are good investments. Even the house may not be a good investment. Uh, so if you start to think about that, what is actually valuable in your life? Is the, is the wealth, the money in your bank account, or the number in, in some investment portfolio, or is it actually the time you have? I consider wealth that if I don't want to work today, I don't want to do anything I don't need to do. I don't need to, need to do anything maybe this week or even this month. How much time you have to do whatever you like? Can you do that for a year? Can you do that for a decade? Can you do that keeping up your expenses? And remember, it's not how much you earn, but how low your expenses are. So if you start to think about in these terms, the wealth has a different meaning. It can give you peace of mind, but you have to probably give up something. How did you come to kind of develop that um, position on what wealth is for you and, and, you know, embodying that and starting to live that, right? Is that something you had to discover or was that something that was more entrenched in, you know, values and culture that was, uh, you know, instilled in you at a younger age? Well, I would love to have learned about the compound interest earlier on. And I really hate that nobody told me. So I was too, uh, too, too, too old for that, you know, to get really the leverage out of it. Un uh, unless I'm living like 150 or 200 years, then I'm still, you know, like I can, I can make it. But otherwise, it's like a bit of too late. Um, that's, so that's a really powerful lesson. Um, the other thing is that I, I'm always been curious. So I've been observing, looking at the people, learning a lot. So those are the lessons I don't think it, it, it was in the, the Finnish culture or the European culture. I, I don't think it was any of that. It was not even in the education per se. They don't usually teach these things which are valuable. So you have to just uh, get the lessons yourself in, in that sense. Um, but um, I was kind of, I wouldn't say lucky, but I, I, in my early 20s, I was living in, in the southern France spending my weekends in Monaco. So I was in a good party. So I see people who are, you know, really wealthy. I, I met some really amazing people who are humble. They just have their t-shirt on and, you know, you don't know their net worth, but you know, it's obviously somewhere, you know, really high. And, and you know, what they do, what they did not do, how they, I was having discussions and, and meeting. And, and you, then you see that it's, it's not, you know, exactly the wealth. What do you think, what it is? It's probably not that. And, and, and then it also makes you humble when you're traveling and usually landing on the knees or, you know, some of these places where there's a high density of uh, high net worth individuals. It's never a good idea to compare yourself to somebody. So I remember one, there was one discussion and this was not about money, but it's related. Uh, the person next to me was asking that, you know, we were on a two hours flight or something. So there was like time for conversation. We were talking almost most of the time. And he was asking that, do I consider traveling a lot? And this was in the late 90s. And I was saying that, yeah, well, thinking out loud that, okay, I probably go like a few times a week flying somewhere. So yeah, I, I think I'm flying quite a lot. 
And later on the conversation, he didn't comment anything. But then I realized that that person is almost every day, you know, flying. So I was just like, yeah, I'm not really traveling at all. So it's 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 there's always someone who is, you know, in a higher level, whatever your relative comparison is. So if you stop that game, it it, it becomes easier. So the, these were sort of the lessons I was I was seeing um, quite early on, and and you know, getting the getting the confidence and the understanding that it's not how much money you make if you don't know you know what to, what to do with the money or you know if you're just showing off you and, and money cannot buy your happiness people are looking you you know they're not looking at you if you have a ferrari they just want to imagine themselves in that ferrari mm. uh, but they don't see you and it doesn't make you more successful if you have that one so it's not actually the you know the, the things around you it doesn't make you happy Given that you've worked with a lot of Scandinavians, Europeans, you know, Americans, that idea of the mindset and comparing yourself to others and uh, the importance of consumerism and consumables, do you think that's more or less prevalent in any of the different areas uh, or the entrepreneurs or that you've worked with? I think it's more like an individual thing. Obviously, there are differences because of culture and working life. For example, if you're comparing just the, the U.S. net worth or, the, or, or how much you're earning per year, and then you're looking at the low numbers, what the Europeans are doing. But you're actually forgetting that you know there's a lot of stuff we're paying on taxes. So the education is free, the healthcare is free, and it's universal. There's also a lot of holidays. Like now we are in the, in the final days of June, and a lot of the Finns... Most of the Scandinavians, uh, Nordics, in Nordic, the, the people are going for holiday maybe for four weeks, five weeks, some even, I know some entrepreneurs going for two months. So how often do you, you do that in the, the American? Think about, you know, in those terms as well. And this is just the summer. You know, it's not the only holiday. There, you know, there's Christmas time. There's some, you know, you probably want to go skiing. So there's, you know, that. And, and there's something also in the fall. So what are those worth? And, and if you're not working 14 hours a day, 12 hours a day, you're working. There are even some companies here who are actually having four days a week and they're still having the same salary. So what is the comparisons, the culture? I think that changes quite a lot, obviously from the outset, but, but the, the mindset of work-life balance and appreciating what you do and how you do, I think that's mainly individual stuff so so someone who's looking to adjust their mindset right um and get to the point where you know the bank account or the comparisons aren't as important anymore where do they start on that journey because for someone who's caught up in it right and doesn't know any better it's always more 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 better 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 right and so how do you how do you break out of that Either you stop voluntarily or you stop somehow. I, I guess those are the two. Maybe there's some third ways as well. But usually I, I think it is what people do that they just they jump on other things if you don't stop. If you don't need to work, but you, you just keep your busy, busy with some, some other things. Uh, I've been interviewing quite a many successful entrepreneurs in my podcast. And I've been asking these questions, what makes you happy? And, and there's a lot of these questions and, and you will get the stories. But what I'm seeing many of them the real wealthy ones uh, seems to be really curious. They're not going for the, you know, making a lot of money. It's the byproduct of, of their curiosity and then they stumble upon something. And even when they have the, all the money in the world, you know, that basically, you know, it's enough. You don't need to work any, any day anymore uh, just because of earning a living. But they, they still do stuff. They still build companies, they're still curious, they still keep on doing those things which actually keep them excited. And uh, I, I think that's one of the most important things. And uh, it, it's, it's not really about the money, but, but certainly where to start. I think it's good to stop if you made all, maybe an exit. Maybe it's good to completely stop, empty your calendar. I mean completely empty, you know, just take a year off, maybe two years off, don't do anything, become so bored, you know, you know, throw your phone away, go to an isolated island, just, you know, do sand cakes and, and just stay at the sea and become so bored that you actually become creative and you just sort of start to 
enjoy the life and the living and, and then, you know, sort of reset the table and then think what I actually want to do. Maybe you want to play piano, maybe you want to become a performing artist and you don't know how to sing or play or, you know, it's something else you want to do with your life. And uh, usually that's the way to, to discover what you want to do. And, and then maybe you figure out also that you have a bigger mission you want to fulfill because now you have the money, now you have the means, maybe you have also some network and, and you can do stuff, but it maybe it doesn't need any money to accomplish that. But you have all the time you can actually now dedicate and do stuff. So I don't know, only you can know what's good for you, but usually either you do it voluntarily or you don't do it at all because you just haven't realized and you keep on doing the similar pattern in a different shape or form. Definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing, expecting the same result. Uh, I, I sense a deserted island retreat in your future, Petri, of uh, offering to clients uh, to go unplug and find purpose. Um, but what what makes you happy? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's not money. Uh, it's, I think, a curiosity. It's just enjoying little things. I used to travel a bit too much. I've been doing quite a lot of things you could consider, you know, that you can you can explore and do things. But the, one of the things, uh, one of my guests actually, the next episode, uh, by the name, the, the title is Found a Burnout. So you can figure out what happened to him. He said that uh, he realized that you cannot escape your mind. So no matter where you go, how further far you travel, you still have you with you, you know, your, your thoughts and your ideas and, and those, those stuff. So you cannot escape that, you know, the scenery can change, but you cannot change that unless you decide to do something about it. So when you realize that you don't need to travel, you don't need to do a lot of things to, to enjoy. So you can actually have a nice, decent cup of uh, espresso. You can enjoy the, the nice weather. You can enjoy what you have. And, and do what you actually love to do. Uh, actually, it makes life really simple. Most of the stuff doesn't make you happy. Maybe it's nice to shop around a bit. Maybe it's the, the feeling is nice that you're actually exploring something. But when you get it, you don't probably really need it. So what I what makes me happy uh, is the little things. I also, I'm always curious. So that's why I have these two podcasts. I'm talking with people. I'm helping these startups. I figured out that I'm, I'm pretty good uh, figuring out uh, the hard part, the difficult stuff, bringing clarity. I, I love complex cases. So I'm trying to find founders, startup founders who have brilliant ideas. And then, then I want to team up with them, work with them, and, and then build these companies because the startups are the hardest thing you can do in the world. Because you, you don't have a business model, you don't have anything. And if it's complex and there's no, you know, like the first T40, how do you build the first cars who actually you become successful? You have to do it for the first time. Obviously, not all of them are that complex, but I'm, I'm, I tend to love these cases which are really complex. So I want to work with these brilliant people, make these things happen. And uh, that's sort of just pure joy for me to, to work with uh, great people, do new stuff, build new things. And uh, you can basically do that with the Google Meet or Zoom nowadays. You don't need to travel anywhere. You can have your comfortable, nice coffee machine. And the next minute you just click and, and watch Netflix or you go walk outside. And, and, and so the life is pretty good nowadays uh, in, in many ways if you, if you just decide to do it. And if you don't have a busy schedule, there's a lot of possibilities and opportunities what you can do. So I was actually doing some TikToks earlier today as well. So I'm, I'm always doing some crazy stuff as well, uh, just for the, for the fun of it, learning and, and testing what can be done and or what's, what's new and great. What's something you're working on that makes you the most excited today or something you're most curious about that, uh, you know, gives you that happiness that you're exploring? Well, just today, earlier on, I was talking with one uh, Ukrainian uh, founder who actually has the mission of uh, helping now the Ukrainian startups because the Russian war is going on as we speak and they don't have funding. There are these startup companies who are still operating and, and it's important that you know, they're becoming big and, and they're be becoming big and they, they're becoming like hopefully unicorns so they can build a 
the ecosystem and the economy in Ukraine. So he, he has a mission to, to raise funds for the VC capital now to support this while the stuff is happening, not afterwards, which is obviously easier and, and less risky. So he's actually now outreaching and supporting a lot of these startups. And um, that's something I, I, I you know, probably going to help him and kind of already promised to do that. So, so uh, I'm, I'm, you know, keep on doing my mission, building the better companies and, and trying to, to find new ways of in the challenging situations, um, supporting people. That's, I guess, the same answer I give to the previous question, but that's, <laughs> which is kind of exciting as well, because you, you know, how do you solve the, the key objection, I imagine, in that case, right, is obviously there's a war with Russia and there's undetermined outcome, right? Yeah. And therefore yeah. undetermined outcome of what the company, how yeah. do you overcome that with people who are, you know, interested, want to help, but have this tremendous trepidation of Russia and no knowledge, really, right, of what's actually going on down there and, you know, what the probability of the likely outcome either way would be? Yeah, well, we, we don't know, nobody knows, but uh, for example, the, the VC, I'm just using it as an example, the VC fund is established in the US, so the, the entities in the US, there's obviously a lot of people around the world working, helping and supporting, but the structures are there, the companies, the startup companies, uh, the fund will invest are probably also incorporated in the US or in the EU, for example, so there's less of that risk than the teams are, for example, in, in some of the cases, they are in the Western Ukraine ways, you know, Ukraine is a huge place. So it's, it's not like the, it's the whole, whole country is in the war, even though there's uh, air raids and, and the missiles are flying every, every part of the country, unfortunately, but, but still you can operate. So you, it's, it's a matter of, this is what it anyways happens with startups. There's a failure rate and it's not about the war. It's not about that. The most biggest failures happen because there's no, there's no need. The, 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 your product is not needed. There's no customers who want to buy it. Or the, the second biggest, I guess, is that the founders are fighting uh, with and against each other. So, you know, the, the team doesn't work. So these are the, it's already a high risk place. But if you think about it the other way, now Ukraine is a huge opportunity as well. The people are really united. They have a really good motivation to do stuff. And now we should help them as well because now they need the help. So... It's not actually that much money is, is needed to, to support and help, but, the, you know, so I, I think the biggest risk is that you do nothing. If you think about it also, that's what entrepreneurs do. You, you only fail if, you, if you're just uh, still on the floor uh, and, and, and not picking up uh, and, and, and keep on trying. So till you try, you haven't failed. You just have learned the ways which do not work. So in, in that way, I don't, I don't think uh, the, the, the risk is, is not that high because there's a risk of anything and everything. You know, we didn't know that there was COVID happening. I was happily in a tech conference in, uh, in February and maybe it was next week already that we know that was the last conference I attended for two years. <laughs> the last flight I took and I was happily just unaware of that. So you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So, you know, it's just like, which one you regret more? Not helping. Somebody asks you 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 years later that, okay, what did you do? How did you help these people? Well, what's your excuse? For these founders, whether it's the Ukrainians that you're looking to help, right, or maybe listeners of the show uh, who are, you know, starting to build, trying to figure things out, if you were to give them one piece of advice or, you know, hey, focus on this, what, what would that thing be for you? Pick the right people. I think uh, that's what I've been thinking quite a lot and obviously there's no one answer which fits to all the cases. But, but if you think about people, um, let's say that, you know, Elon Musk is willing to spend one hour with you. What would you talk with him? Maybe you could ask something from him. What would Elon Musk allow you to have access? What opportunities would open up for you? And I'm just using him as an example. But if you think about it, in that way, that what one person can do for you, and doesn't need to be the richest man in the world, but if you have someone as a business partner who has the right attitude, has the knowledge, has the network, maybe the expertise already, versus someone who is not exactly the right fit or the, or the employee, 
And if you have a team of these people, or if you have, if you've been building your network uh, of, of good people around you, what opportunities, possibilities you could have? So I would, I would, I would go with the people because even if you have the best idea, but you don't have the people, it's really hard to do things by yourself. But if you don't have the best idea, but you have the best people in your case around you. Maybe it's good enough. So I would say that think really carefully whom you're working with. Check their background. Try a bit. And if it doesn't work, change, change the people because you cannot change the people. For the listeners who want to be able to connect with you, Petri, what's the best way for them to, to reach out and get in contact? Well, you can tweet me. You can send me email. You can come to my website, which is my first name, uh, dot last name. So maybe Liam will put it into the show notes so that uh, it's easier to reach. Um, I should be pretty easy to, to get in contact with. So you can even book a 15 minute call and leave if you if you're bold. Awesome. Well, appreciate your time today, Petri. It was great to be able to chat and uh, hear your perspective. Thank you, Liam, for having me.